Hello world, I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Strategic On, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. Since Chinese Premier Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, the People's Republic of China has been taking a very uncharacteristically belligerent stand against Asia and the world. No longer content to let China bide its time and hide its claws, Xi's foreign policy has, all, has been all about bearing China's fangs and claws for everyone to see. Of the countries of Southeast Asia, most at harm from this Chinese policy is the Philippines. A relatively poor country with a small and outdated armed force, the Philippines can be considered most at risk from Chinese threats. Sharing claims with China and other Southeast Asian nations to the heavily contested South China Sea, the Philippines can only realistically maintain its position, mainly around Scarborough Shoal, with American military support. However, the Philippine government of Rodrigo Duterte does not enjoy good relations with Washington, possibly jeopardizing any bilateral security guarantees. If the Philippines can't count on American support to bail them out of any future confrontation with the People's Republic, what are its alternatives? To discuss this, today we are joined by Dr. Chester Cabalza. Chester is president and founder at the Manila-based think tank, the International Development and Security Cooperation organization, IDSC. Chester, welcome to Strategicon. Thank you for inviting me. Chester, can you tell our listeners what has caused the ructions between Manila and Washington? Okay, um, in 2016, when uh, President uh, Duterte ran for office uh, for presidency in the Philippines, actually, um, he really wanted to uh, offer us three um, flagship projects. One would be the um, independent foreign policy. The second, the, uh, second is the controversial drug war. And lastly would be the Build, Build, Build uh, program, which he promised to the Filipino people. By doing that, of course, uh, he wanted to diversify our relationship, aside from the U.S. being a treaty ally in uh, Asia for so long. And uh, one of the reasons why he wanted to pivot to Beijing is to basically um, diversify our relations. And uh, there were some of the uh, colonial experiences that we experienced with Washington, which... Uh, in uh, Duterte's mind that uh, did not um, align to his own um, values. So basically that was uh, the, uh, some of the uh, um, misgivings that Duterte had with Washington. Now, uh, during the five year um, presidency of Duterte having uh, pivoted to uh, Beijing, we noticed that uh, his promises were actually not uh, fully fulfilled. Uh, for the main reasons that uh, let's discuss the following uh, flagship programs that uh, he has had. First, when it comes to the drug war, of course, uh, it um, received a lot of um, international human rights um, reactions and violations because basically a lot of Filipinos died during that um, a saga on the drug war um, episode. And uh, secondly, up to now, the drug problem in the country has not yet been resolved. So that is a huge vacuum when it comes to this uh, uh, criminal and political um, um, dilemma, uh, which the drug war has offered, uh, uh, has, uh, which we have in the Philippines. Now, on the ind independent foreign policy, I think when he proposed that to the Philippines, it was really unclear. What does he mean by an independent foreign policy? Does that mean that we were away from Washington and uh, yield to, to Beijing? Is that, that was a question basically, but it seems like every year he goes to Beijing for some um, consolidation of, um, of um, concessions with Xi Jinping on the, the volatility of the zero and basically to ask pledges, economic pledges for his uh, third um, flagship program, which is the build, build, build infrastructure. Now, as promised by Beijing that, that they will help us in the uh, build, build, build infrastructure, we saw that uh, nothing has been added to the infra infrastructures of the Philippines. Of course, there were plans, but even up to now, it's been five years already, and we haven't, we haven't seen any uh, mega project coming from uh, China. So that becomes a big problem now, because given that there is the checkbook diplomacy that um, uh, China is offering to us, it seems like it's not uh, been seen and realized, and uh, a lot of Filipinos are asking, where are those projects? Now, the intervention that the China did to us is to um, open up the vaccine diplomacy. And of course, uh, given that we are in the pandemic right now, that's how the um, 
uh, they, they put some uh, interventions on the uh, build, build build program uh, of the uh, current administration. But the problem there is, despite the um, offers on the vaccine diplomacy, it seems like uh, Beijing is having a schizophrenic uh, behavior because while they are donating and giving some aid on the um, vaccine diplomacy, at the same time, they are still in their usual as bus uh, business as usual in the West Philippine Sea by, uh, with, with their military aggression and uh, basically with their uh, maritime um, power ambition, which uh, hurts the Filipinos because um, it's hurting the sovereignty of the Philippines. So those are some of the things that uh, we have heard. I'm just wondering, Chester, I mean, you know, with regard to the whole One Belt, One Road infrastructure program, right. there's been a lot of things happening within that space that have been less than stellar in terms of how recipient countries see Chinese assistance, because this is not the first time that I've heard that, mm. you know, the Chinese have been promising a lot and delivering very little. But with regard to the Philippines, is that something to do with the fact that you guys are still te technically in the U.S.-Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty? And so mm. the Chinese are trying to use this as a way of, I don't know, strong arming Duterte to loosen more of, Philippine, uh, more, the, more of the Philippines' links to the United States? Right, right. I get the point. You know, given the wolf, uh, sophistication of the wolf warrior diplomacy that Beijing is ushering right now, they saw some of the gaps with our uh, defense treaties with the United States. First would be the mutual defense treaty. Uh, in that agreement, it says that uh, in case of foreign aggression, the U.S. would uh, help us. But we saw that from the since the Obama's uh, pivot to Asia, um, and then um, after that, there was the Trump's Indo-Pacific strategy. The more Beijing became aggressive, and some of the features in the West Philippine Sea were, were controlled by, 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 by the People's Liberation Army Navy. So we were like asking, where is Washington? Where, what happened to the promises of Washington at that time? So we saw some vacuum there. That's why um, Manila toned down its expectation from Manila at the time. And the reason for that is to basically uh, befriend Beijing, hoping that by befriending uh, Beijing, uh, they would spare some of our islands. But it seems like Beijing is not changing their behavior. They are very consistent with their plans. And suddenly, Manila was some um, surprise because all we thought that by friendship, they could at least spare some of our islands there. Now, um, of course, there was a flip-flopping, changing um, foreign policy uh, coming from Manila because of the volatility of the uh, regional security and what is happening in the West Philippine Sea. So we thought that um, Beijing would definitely help us, but nonetheless, it's not helping us. So we again um, ask a favor from Washington by uh, definitely um, um, uh, having the, the mutual defense treaty. But another problem last year was the um, uh, abrogation of the um, uh, visiting forces agreement that would operationalize the mutual defense treaty. Because, of course, one of the allies of Duterte, who is a senator, uh, was not granted with, a, with an American visa. So um, Duterte thought that uh, abrogating the visiting forces agreement would be a punishment for Washington. But, of course, uh, the U.S. was alarmed by the situation. And even up to now, uh, the, uh, the, the abrogation is still pending. So in other words, they cannot operationalize the mutual defense treaty because of the abrogation of the uh, visiting forces agreement. And there's, there's another uh, agreement with the Americans, uh, the enhanced uh, defense uh, mutual, um, uh, 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 something like that, uh, that would uh, help us in a way to enhance that, uh, which was proposed by Obama at the time. But nonetheless, this is the, the, the problem here. Despite all the um, support and help coming from Washington, it seems like Duterte is snubbing the efforts of Washington, mainly because uh, there was a concession that he made with Beijing, which up to now remains questionable to a lot of Filipinos. We do not know what would, uh, what is that concession that he has made with uh, Beijing, because uh, two nights ago, he has this um, um, pronouncement for the first time during the pandemic, he discussed about the West Philippine Sea issue. And he said that there's nothing wrong with, uh, with, with, with Chinese illegal fishing in the West Philippine Sea unless they uh, dig 
and they dig uh, something there, that's the only time we will react. And it seems like that's a little bit problematic. We've been fighting a lot over the West Philippine Sea, and all of a sudden the commander in chief and the uh, and the chief architect of the Philippines uh, of on foreign policy in the Philippines is saying that. And uh, despite that, the uh, ministers or uh, secretaries of foreign affairs and um, defense are already adamant on their stance on the West Philippine Sea. So what is the problem here? So it seems like there is a uh, flip-flopping and inconsistencies with the pronouncements and policies of the government. Sounds That's cool. why even that, even if we have a strong or maybe um, uh, dwindling um, alliance with the United States, it seems like Was uh, Duterte is not giving much attention to Washington. Well, all I can say about that is that it seems from what you've said that the Philippines is kind of still a victim of Obama's foreign policy. But now I'm going to switch to David. David's got a question. Just, uh, just something I was thinking. Yes, Tim. Good morning. That, good morning. Just something I was thinking about as you were speaking then, and that is it's difficult enough to understand the sort of Philippines decision-making process. But if we look at it from Beijing's perspective, they're happy to intimidate or they're happy to buy influence. And it's almost like they've been sort of, you know, counterbalancing, well, we can promise the Philippines infrastructure or we right. can try intimidation. And if intimidation works, why would we spend money on infrastructure? So could we yeah, hypothesize we that we're now getting a combination of intimidation at sea and vaccines as the carrot, and that is as good a deal as the Philippines is going to get from Beijing? Right. You know, um, um, there was a news lately, uh, actually recently, stating that um, Duterte has been tough with the Filipino people, but he could not be tougher to Beijing. And that has been a question, because how come that Uh, even if a lot of Filipinos now are asking the president to be more strong in his pronouncements against China, how come that uh, he cannot bend some of their concessions with Beijing? Now, uh, regarding that, uh, I think uh, the question now uh, is uh, definitely this is a, um, uh, um, a score for Beijing because they are intimidating us and without going into war and they are winning. And it seems like their um, grand strategy towards the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea is basically effective be, without any um, arms race and uh, basically uh, by simply doing uh, intimidation against us. Now, of course, um, they also attribute it to the aggressiveness of their um, diplomats because basically the ambassador and defense attaches and the uh, other uh, attaches in the Uh, of China in Manila are uh, doing a lot of things also. Of course, uh, with their vaccine diplom uh, diplomacy in the Philippines, um, imagine that uh, they were the first one to, to, to offer uh, support aid uh, to the Philippines. And uh, uh, despite that, um, the Philippines has um, uh, a number of uh, alliance to other big uh, uh, and big, uh, major powers also. Nonetheless, of course, um, uh, another thing would be um, their um, um, interventions on the... Um, Uh, infrastructure programs because uh, I also noticed that as I, I wear another hat as one of the uh, reviewers for uh, the environmental uh, uh, certificate where we give that to um, to mega projects and I also noticed that most of the mega projects that are being approved now and there's a priority to some of the mega projects for uh, China funded um, infrastructures in the country. And although it's not yet uh, constructed, but the, uh, it's still uh, the process is, uh, is ongoing, meaning to say that um, maybe after uh, the Turkish office, those uh, infrastructures will be built but, and completed. But, um, you know, there's, uh, that, that, that is a, um, a confusion, a bafflement for us here in Manila, because basically, uh, how come that um, China is winning without doing anything? And uh, by simply uh, offering a lot of uh, things to us by checkbook, by using checkbook, checkbook diplomacy, and also their vaccine diplomacy. So, in other words, um, the, the the problem that I see here is the lack of foresight, strategic foresight, and um, implementation of strategies in, in the Philippines. Uh, for from from 2000 until um, 2000 last year, 2000. Uh, Yes, yeah, 2020, we just completed the, our uh, national uh, defense um, uh, military strategy, national uh, 
defense strategy, national security, uh, security uh, strategy, and national security policy. But there was no un uh, overarching um, mechanism on how to, um, to, to consolidate all of these strategies, meaning to say that uh, we use it differently in different uh, situations. So it's not harmonized. And they're knowing a Filipino style and culture here, uh, sometimes uh, we tend to forget the uh, unified command because uh, of uh, silo in government and uh, stuff like that. And uh, this becomes a problem because uh, each one of the uh, major services in the armed forces has their, uh, have their own uh, style uh, strategy. And also, secondly, we still don't have a strong naval and air force air power. And if we look at the external defense of the Philippines, it's very weak. Because for the longest time, we just relied to the Americans. It's only recently that we decided and thought of building our own defense posture on our external defense. That's the reason why lately we've been acquiring uh, some uh, um, naval um, assets and uh, military hardware for us to meet at least the minimum defense uh, posture uh, for, for the country. But so far, in terms of the um, strength, we, we, we really, um, uh, we, of course, definitely Beijing is more powerful than us. But, you know, uh, there were um, cases where numbers can be uh, outweighed by, uh, or, or strategies can be outweighed by numbers. We've seen that in uh, Philippine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, John. Chester, I was just wondering, I mean, the Philippines is an archipelagic state, and you you made mention about what you consider the vulnerabilities of the armed forces. Mm. But of course, you know, if you're looking at it from an external perspective, there's that. And then there's, of course, the ongoing internal security challenges that the Philippines right, right. faces, right? So you've got the Muslim separatists in the southern island state of Mindanao. Mm. You've got the communist New People's Army, which is no longer mm. really communist. It's just an opportunistic mess. Um, and then you've got a bunch of clan-based private armies running running around in the back, you know, in the in the uh, uh, back blocks of the Philippines, causing mischief wherever they can. So, in in many ways, you know, when we're talking about the Philippine armed forces and you know, modernizing it and making it user friendly for the Philippine commanders to actually not only get on top of the external external challenges, but also right. the internal challenges. How how much effort? needs to be expended because it seems like it's going to be a very costly and very lengthy exercise yeah one significant yeah. it's a big cultural issue yeah. so if you don't mind just to speak to that too as much as dollars affect all of this we can see that the dollars flowed towards the philippines early on in the war on terror which allowed capacity for internal action to increase significantly but there was no equivalent money or cultural shift to prepare to deal with external challenges. So in a sense, the war on terror doubled down the historical norm in the Philippines of preparing for internal threats. So now the shift to an external threat is like the strategic world has been turned upside down in the Philippines literally overnight. Yeah, that shows the complexity of the national security issue in the Philippines, because basically, you know, you have a duality of a situation or problem here. You have internal uh, threat. At the same time, you have uh, external um, um, problem also. Uh, now, um, all in policymakers in the Philippines are not even um, well versed when it comes to national security. That comes a problem here. That's the reason why we have flip flopping of policy. And also, um, the um, armed forces uh, should also delegate the internal security issue to the Philippine uh, to the Philippine uh, police. Because basically, that, that the internal issue on uh, terrorism, insurgency, should be the problem of the police and no longer with the military. Because the role of the military is to basically secure and protect our sovereignty in, on our external defense. That has been a problem here. And also that was written in our constitution. But because of the um, laxity, and of course, because of the lack of trust to the uh, police, Philippine National Police, then that role was delegated again to the armed forces. So the armed forces is wearing two hats here for its um, um, defense role and constabulary role. So meaning to say it's really complex because there are many um, demands and commands uh, of the president to the armed forces. 
and you know uh, it's overheating everything and also the situation on the the um, internal and the external is not properly managed because uh, because of the many policies and strategies that are not cohesive and uh, integrated and harmonized and also sorry just the, in, budget, in, in your opinion though i mean what is the what is the what is the national priority is it the internal challenges or is it the external challenges because from an outsider's perspective, right. I see the Philippines with all its internal challenges confronting a giant like China who's cashed right. up to the max and is doing all kinds of strange things to the Philippines. But is there a, is there a, a situation where um, CCP operatives can dump a bag of money in some private malicious hands and to go keep crazy? Keep it internal. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and to keep the, you know Manila basically in that state of confusion because all of a sudden you've got these, these small groups you know what we would normally call a low intensity conflict with the Filipino government, all of a sudden becoming higher much intensity higher, yeah, because exactly. of Chinese intervention. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, is is there is there this possibility that you've got to also take into account? I mean, right. You know, in the Philippines, um, one of our issues here would be how to deal with uh, these uh, security threats, and it seems like our country, our policymakers, are just very, very active with the situation. There is no priority. It depends on which um, threat um, would uh, impede the national security first. We need to say that uh, if there is a, uh, uh, a terrorist act, then we focus on that. If the Chinese uh, incursions uh, happens, then we focus on that. So we need to say there is, no, uh, there is no prioritization, although it sets an unequal footing also. Uh, it's a very um, reactive uh, and limited on how we foresee it and uh, definitely on how we resolve the issue. And also, um, like what uh, I've been telling here, there is no strong policy and um, that, 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 that would guide the government on the priorities on solving the national security issues. But I would like to suggest that, of course, given that we have already, uh, first, on the external defense, we have already completed all the uh, different strategies and doctrines uh, that the um, armed forces and the uh, maritime um, uh, enforcement agencies should be using. Now, it's high time that we should also put the national territorial defense framework because that framework would help us on how to synthesize everything and what would be the strategies, the best strategy that, we, that, that could be used. I know for a sure uh, for, for for I know for for a fact that the Philippines has been uh, uh, excellent in uh, its uh, law fair. We are very good in that. We 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 won the Hague ruling, and we have uh, best minds on how to persuade uh, the president and uh, other the international community on the use of uh, the international law. I think we we've been uh, doing that a lot. But when it comes to uh, to 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 the military operations, I think we are lacking on that. But recently. Our um, Coast Guard and um, the Navy and Marines are doing its responsibility right now. They are voicing, they are raising the flag right now. They are um, uh, asserting um, our rights and sovereignty there. We are rocking the boat so far because we learned that China is not changing in way. And uh, there's an upcoming election next year. And that would also uh, change the, uh, the, 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 the ballots next year of. Uh, whether or not uh, Duterte's uh, uh, promises and campaigns uh, were successful. Secondly, on the internal uh, defense, uh, security threats, um, we still have the longest uh, insurgency in Asia, or if not in the world. Uh, but it seems like the, the, the strategy on bread tagging lately has, been, it has become very controversial here. Uh, has, are, it's not effective. One is because I keep on telling to the media about the armed forces uh, lack of Intelligence gathering. They are not so good. It has to retrain them. They, they, the, 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 the armed forces should be trained and, of course, um, integrate some of their um, um, counterinsurgency measures and the strategies there. Secondly, and also because uh, we, we, we dislike that because um, these are government funded uh, intelligence gathering and they are wasting the money of the Filipino people. So, in other words, the problem there is their doctrine and strategy. And they have to retrain their assets, uh, their, their, their agents, basically, and uh, officers, because it's not really effective. Uh, on the um, counterterrorism, 
um, there, there's no effective uh, policy yet that I've seen so far. That's the reason why uh, we've been asking um, allies, like of course, um, and partners, strategic partners like the United States, we've seen that in Marawi, and of course, uh, Australia is helping us also uh, on counterterrorism and cybersecurity. So I think um, when it comes to this, it, there are flaws and we need um, um, the, the whole of um, alliance uh, approach here when it comes to our internal and external um, uh, um, um, if, uh, security issues. But uh, I think uh, my, 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 my suggestion and recommendation here is that we should build our own indigenous capability because there are ASEAN countries who were able to handle their, uh, their problems Look at uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. Without their, um, uh, without uh, support from major powers, although lately, of course, they, they've been communicating and, of course, extending the not verbal with the major powers. But because of their own indigenous uh, capability on um, how to counter big powers, especially uh, against their sovereignty, they were able to uh, modernize their armed forces using their own capability. And I think the Philippines should learn from that because we've been relying so much with the major powers, particularly with the United States and lately with, the, with China. You know, this confusing um, independent foreign policy is not helping us so far because there's none. There's no independent foreign policy, basically. Just, uh, just on that, uh, Tim would like to um, say something. Yep. I assume that it would be in Washington's interest um, to... Uh, counteract Beijing's influence in the Philippines? Would that be a correct assumption to make? Pretty much. Hmm. So clearly there is some advantage to uh, Washington um, not providing the resources, aka even money, to counteract the kind of corruption that you would find in the police, hmm. let's say, in the Philippines um, that is typical of a developing nation. Hmm. Uh, because that kind of corruption uh, then also allows the CIA to come in and do some kind of um, insurgency as well. So uh, it fundamentally, it seems as if to counteract any kind of Beijing influence also removes the uh, typical American um, uh, form of influence in the Philippines. So their inaction actually kind of speaks to um them wanting to do effectively the same thing is that a safe is that is that a fair thing to say david again yeah. so again business as usual doesn't work for the americans because business as usual was to throw money at the philippines most of which got siphoned off it would have to be a completely different model of equipment and training and capacity building and that's something they've not thought of doing and they don't really want to put the personnel and equipment in and it's very much the same as this is the kind of relationship the philippines needs with every potential partner right don't throw money at the philippines send a training team and okay. provide the equipment for people to be trained on right so the counter insurgent so okay so we can we can say that that money wouldn't be a solution or money doesn't necessarily ensure development no. but to get philippines to a developed state if you were to call it that um, is is about throwing resources at it. So the Australia fact that, going there to help with counterterrorism, actively being there. Now it's right. a micro scale, and even we at our scale mm. should do something far bigger. But the only thing that's going to work is actually training people and equipping people. So the only money coming at them is their normal pay from the Filipino government, right. and everything else is coming from, you know, the partnership. Yeah. To build capacity in a meaningful way. And that's how you get the cultural change. You're not going to get cultural change any other way because people need to line their pockets because historically that was normal. Right, right, right. So, it, but, but that's, that, well, I guess this is my point, right? It's in, it's in both Beijing and Washington's interest to, to effectively keep that status quo in the Philippines because that's how, they, that's how they operate on an international scale. Whereas that is not, well, I, I think it, well, as I see it, but in, in Australia could step in and provide resources to the Philippines and then actually end up with a proximal and capable friend. Yeah. Well, well that would, that would be ideal, right. except for the fact that, you know, there are some people in the Australian defense environment who would say that we haven't got our crap together either. Yeah, but we haven't. And the only way we're going to get better is to help other people. Right. Well, no, I agree so through with that. training, you get more competent. Yeah. So yeah. we're in a situation here where it needs to be the Japanese, us, 
the Brits, the South Koreans, mm. everybody with capacity who wants to get more competent in their own right, who wants to justify their dispense. Here's, here's a very uncomfortable question, though, uh, spinning off from what happened. <laughs> so, Chester, okay. the, um, um, uh, the uncomfortable question is, how confident do you think foreign interests, foreign military interests, for instance, would be dealing with the local Filipino environment in terms of, you know, members of the armed forces, members of the national police. I mean, you've unpacked for us just how complex the Filipino security situation is. Right. But if, um, say, for instance, you know, Canberra, Washington, Tokyo, Seoul, they don't have political confidence in the Duterte government or they don't have confidence in the Filipino structure as it's currently conceived, what mm. is the likelihood of the Philippines receiving the benefit of these countries assistance in any meaningful way yeah uh, i i like the question even if it's a little bit comfortable but basically it all boils down to the whole of alliance approach yeah where basically when you uh, in that uh, whole of alliance approach you have uh, different um, countries with different capabilities and uh, given that of course uh, we know for a fact that the philippines has a um, a weak defense posture when it comes to its uh, internal and external defense uh, it will ask for uh, the help of um, foreign uh, uh, armed forces uh, with their military hardware and uh, strategies and doctrines. But, um, you know, um, like uh, what I'm, I've been telling uh, to the media in the Philippines here, it all boils down to our own strategy and uh, how uh, and our policy. Because basically, the support coming from other countries, particularly on the militar military uh, hardware that uh, you are donating to us although some questions some of the donations are um are not brand new and are second hand and also um you know when you donate also you have to um to train the people on how to use and manipulate it so human resources is also important right? so it should the the hardware and the human resources should align to this strategy and values of the armed forces and other enforcement agencies. Because even if you have those equipment, if you don't know how to use it and it doesn't align to your strategy, then it's not, it's, it's, it's not effective. We saw that in Marawi, we saw that in the West Philippine Sea. And uh, so far, you know, even if donations are, we, we see influx of donations. If the policies, and these strategies are not adapting to the changing times, then that becomes a problem. Because we saw how come that counter, uh, how come that we have the longest insurgency in Asia, despite all this, um, uh, this, this, this uh, support coming from major powers. And it becomes a problem. It becomes a question. One is, of course, I do understand that uh, we we have issues on social injustices corruption, political, uh, patri uh, you know, um, different uh, uh, political issues here. Uh, but, you know, it all boils down to basic services. If the government is responsive enough and would address the issues of poverty, social injustices, definitely their counterinsurgency would become more successful. The military strategy is just a short-term remedy but the long-term remedy would be addressing the social issues that have been hampering the development of the Philippines. In other words, it should come from us. The development is the answer. Prosperity would not make people cling to terrorism and, uh, and insurgencies. And definitely, they would be supporting and helping the government if their tummy are not Hungry. Can I can so, I just, uh, can, can I just uh, uh, intervene here? I'm I'm curious again. This is now we're starting to delve into the less comfortable aspects of Filipino security. But one question, and it's a hypothetical question, so you know, yeah. feel free not to answer it because if it's sensitive, that's no, okay. But um, would things be easier in the Filipino kind of security environment were there a different political leader in Manila? 
or a different elite. Let's or, make it two part. All right. Because the leader is, <laughs> yeah. you know, the leader is someone who the, the, the outside Western world look at and goes, wow, how's that possible? But you scratch a little bit deep and you go, it makes perfect sense based on the historical elite in the Philippines. When the historical elite are a problem, you get strange leaders. Yeah. Chester. <laughs> right. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, um, that's true because um, we thought that uh, having a strong leader would basically help us um, be uplifted uh, from all the uh, many issues that we have in the Philippines. But we saw that uh, lately, uh, we see, uh, of course, the third test um, regime uh, is at the twilight right now because there will be elections come 20, uh, June 2022. And it seems like uh, some of the promises he had made for us are not um, are not yet fulfilled. And uh, going back to the kind of leadership that we have in the Philippines, it seems like, uh, you know, um, the reason why um, we have not yet arrived economically, uh, economically speaking and also uh, the kind of respect that uh, we should be gaining from the international community is that uh, there is a problem also in our political culture here. Uh, given that uh, you know um, issues on um, on the type of leaders that uh, we are voting are not um, are, are not uh, definitely uh, uh, helping us to advance some of the uh, um, expectations that uh, we have them. And secondly, um, there are uh, there is a huge disparity between the rich and poor, and the middle class is uh, very uh, small. And when you have a small middle class, naturally, you would have a lot of deceptions coming from our elites and oligarchs to secure their own vested interests. So basically, you see uh, the complexity of the um, um, Filipino society here. And thirdly, I think um, right now, the in terms of our military, uh, the armed forces, they are still uh, staging their... Um, militarization uh, program and uh, we are still at the second stage of that and uh, the third stage will commence uh, in 2023 to 2028 to at least a minimum credible deterrence but um, I hope that uh, the armed forces also would be apolitical and uh, sometimes because in the Philippines they've been dancing with the wolf with the president for their own survival also and vis-a-vis -vis for the survival of the president and we see that kind of uh, dependence coming from two uh, different institutions that would give us a perception that the institutions in the Philippines are not that strong because it's very personalistic. It depends on the, the personality and the uh, behavior and perception uh, of the leader. And that becomes a problem because the, the president, uh, the, the role of the president in the Philippines is very strong. He is the commander, of, uh, uh, commander in chief of the armed forces and also the chief architect of our uh, foreign affairs. And if those things are, uh, if, if his uh, policies and programs are not effective, basically, then it will give us a domino effect on how we would want to have stronger institutions in the Philippines. And knowing that uh, there is a very uh, small uh, oligarchs and uh, middle class in the Philippines, definitely um, common Filipinos will follow selfish and greedy um, oligarchs and elites. Hmm. And uh, th this will uh, have a um, effect on how uh, we progress as a nation state. Just so a, that's just the a, complexity of everything here in the Philippines. There's a there's another interesting angle that I just thought of. Um, when I was doing my uh, my honors degree at Flinders University, my thesis was on the U.S. basis in the Philippines. Now, of course, hmm. um, the U.S. withdrew because Mount Pinatubo, but also there was this Filipino nationalism that really put well, a lot of pressure on the Americans. Well, and, and the New World Order. The well, idea well, it was all going to be warm and fuzzy. That's true too. That's true too. So we had all of these things that sort of came up and it basically made America's position in the Philippines pretty much untenable. But, you know, focusing for, for the moment on the anti-American aspect, 
Hmm. Is there a sense that America doesn't really know what to do with the Philippines now that it lost? Right, Super I agree. Fight? I agree. Right? <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> it doesn't, I've, uh, it knows how to have a colonial state. It doesn't know how to have a partner who needs help. Right, right. And yeah. it would, you know, it probably well, couldn't get away with wanting a colonial state back because, you know, the Filipinos wouldn't tolerate it. But the Americans either want freedom of access to do as they please or they want a you know, fast outcome and they can't have either. So they're almost picking nothing instead. Yeah, well, well, they are, and, and they're creating a, a major problem in Southeast Asia. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed, you know, like um, I was having a look at the uh, the map of the Philippines, and the, the thing that, you know, I understand the jostling of uh, or swarming of Chinese fishing boats around certain contested areas in the Western Philippine Sea, but the island of Palawan seems, for me, the most vulnerable to... Yeah further encroachment because it actually sits a little bit further away from the the main Indonesian archipelago and it juts out into the South China Sea. So do you think that perhaps from an external perspective, uh, you know, the uh, the forces in Beijing are looking at Palawan as a potential mm. Achilles heel of the Philippines to move into? Okay, I want to address first um, the uh, disconnect of Washington to Manila uh, partially. Uh, for a temporarily uh, for a period of time when the, um, it was during the uh, time of um, Fidel um, no, no, Cory Aquino mm. when there was a decision coming from Manila that, that to expel the um, uh, the uh, American uh, bases because of the strong nationalism at the time and we were uh, constituting our own uh, constitution so that was the context at the time and of course uh, Washington thought that uh, maybe they lost interest with the uh, Manila and uh, focus their attention to some other issues worldwide. But again, they forgot that the Philippines is really a strategic, uh, it has a strategic um, role in, 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 in the Asia Pacific and now with the newly concocted into Pacific region. And uh, with, with, because of that, um, we did not see how Beijing became powerful. And of course, uh, through, their, uh, the, through Beijing's diplomacy, there was a with the diplomacy of, uh, of uh, Jiang Zemin to uh, Fidel Ramos. And then they started to get our mischief if one of the, that started the, their incursion and their invasion in the West Philippine Sea in 1995. And then there was the standoff, uh, Scarborough standoff in 2012 that uh, made us realize that we have to expose all our um, uh, legal remedies against China because that's on the, um, um, strengths that we have because we cannot counter them militarily speaking. And then recently in 2019, you have the, uh, the ramming uh, of uh, the Marte militia and then of course the current tweets right now uh, we have here. Okay, and um, Washington saw the strategic importance of Manila, particularly in their um, uh, phone ops operations, the freedom of navigation and overflight. And it took time for them to realize that. How come they, that they ignored Manila, even that Beijing is becoming powerful? Be, maybe because there was a denial also from Washington that Beijing can mount its own grand strategy and become a very powerful country. I think that was one of the reasons. And Manila at the time when uh, Duterte became the president also um, snubbed Washington for five years now. And until next year, basically, because of the um, uh, lack of importance that Washington gave to Manila. And now, uh, Washington learned its lesson, and they've been trying to, 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 to find ways on how to deal with Duterte and with the Philippines, because they thought that, and because they took for granted uh, their stance with Manila. Now, uh, they tried to offer help during uh, the counter um, insert, uh, with the counterterrorism efforts in Marawi, but still, um, Duterte is not them. There were efforts uh, uh, with their economic. Uh, they can, they could not support us economically because of uh, uh, through uh, many infrastructure programs because of their um, belief that human rights is primary. That's the reason why. Um, Beijing is very aggressive because they don't consider that in their case when they would help the government in their infrastructure program. And um, Russia also doesn't uh, look at that way. 
that's the reason why um, Manila pivoted also to uh, Moscow. And um, remember, these are all um, popular leaders. You have uh, Putin, Xi Jinping, Duterte there. And uh, of course, uh, Trump left uh, is no longer in that picture. But even if both were popular leaders, uh, Manila thought that um, Washington was not serious in their uh, Indo-Pacific region uh, strategy because uh, of their focus on the trade war at the time with Beijing. So those were the considerations so far. But now, uh, here we are again. The Philippines is uh, the global headline because of the Whitson Reef. But it seems like the president is a little bit quiet on how to contain China because uh, in my own theory, perhaps there was concession that he made back then in his previous visits to official visits to Beijing. And uh, secondly, um, um, the Philippines has become an instrument also why Beijing became so powerful. It allowed China to continue with its mili militarization. And um, also, um, Manila thought that uh, Washington's promise to us when it comes to mutual defense treaty and its other uh, defense treaties as with us cannot be realized. And it's only now that Washington is doing its best again on how to, um, to, to align uh, with, with uh, some of the visions of the government, right? of visions of Manila right now. So, you know, it's, it's evolving so far on how we deal with these um, uh, policies uh, of uh, different uh, powers, uh, basically. And um, I believe also that it's going to be expensive for Washington to um, send some of their uh, war fighting um, um, aircrafts and also um, submarines and other uh, no, frigates and uh, naval. Uh, one thing, one thing. <clears throat> Now, with regard to the Americans having lost uh, Clark Airfield and Subic Bay, Subic Bay still exists as a port, and so and it's a vitally strategic deep water port. And Clark Airfield is still an airfield, right? Uh, can you repeat the the question? Sorry, right. I didn't okay. So it. Subic Bay is still available yeah. as a deep water port, which is highly of great strategic value, right? And, right, right. And Clark Airfield is still an airfield. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, if Americans, if, if the Filipino government were to say it's in our interest to, like, like for instance, here in Australia, we've got a, a rotational presence of Marines that uh, right, 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 well, Darwin. Yeah. So it's not a it's not a permanent presence, but it's kind of like a semi permanent presence. That's no, like Garrison Light. Yeah, like Garrison Light. Yeah, exactly. So couldn't couldn't the Philippines also? I mean, if they were really, if they need. Right, right. But if this happened. Other alternative. If there's no other alternative, Chester, could they not try? <laughs> yeah. You know, something? this this is what happened here. Clark Air Base and Subic Naval Base are turned into economic zones now. Right. So meaning to say that they are no longer that strategic that it used to be. But I've read from uh, from uh, the. Uh, Paul, uh, from the plans of the armed forces that uh, they're trying to do some strategic uh, basic plans, meaning to say that they want to, to reassign some of the bases and uh, focus on some other bases because of its strategic importance. Right. One would be Palawan. Yeah. It has to be protected. Secondly, Sulu in Mindanao. It has to be uh, uh, protected right. also. Mm -hmm. And also the one in Batanes up uh, near, uh, near Taiwan. So Subic and Clark are no longer that uh, strategic because of its uh, transformation as an eco hub. Now, um, if um, secondly, um, there's a uh, modernization plan coming from the armed forces, meaning to say that because of the strategic basing that uh, they are planning, meaning to say that uh, they have to, uh, uh, to to find some other bases, uh, given its strategic importance. And also, uh, there were um, um, plans coming from the armed forces to change the commands also, because of the extent of the uh, China aggression in the Philippines, and also because of the uh, terrorist um, um, threat also in the country. So 
the traditional bases are no longer that effective and strategic. That's why the Philippines has to find some other alternatives. Just just on that check, uh, Chester, mm. um, I've got I've got a problem with the idea that Subic in particular yeah, is particularly a port, an airfield, a, fine, a, a, a deep a, a port. deep water port, a natural deep water harbor is is highly contested strategic. It's a highly contested strategic prize anywhere. And I, I would imagine that even if it's if even if it's now a commercial port, to park an aircraft mm. carrier off that commercial port must still have power. happen. Yeah, and have right, power. Right. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the Philippine Navy, of course, doesn't have you know a lot of right. modern deep deep water ocean going vessels. So I can understand from a local perspective, it may not have uh, strategic value. But for visiting American warships, obviously, where they would pull in. Uh, you know, Subic would be an obvious location for that, right? Uh, yes, um, that's the reason why um, the um, armed forces has to reassess again uh, the uh, bases because basically uh, because of the changing uh, uh, security right now uh, posed by, uh, by, uh, by, by, by China. And uh, also um, um, another thing would be the... Uh, the um, technology that, that the armed forces should also be acquiring of one was of course uh, right now we still have a, a cyber uh, maritime a cyber security maritime uh, technologies that would help us uh, to counter uh, both uh, the Chinese incursion and uh, the, the threats coming uh, from uh, maritime cyber security I haven't uh, seen one and uh, I was one uh, I was proposing that to our Coast Guard and to the Philippine Navy and Marines and um, uh, I think, um, given the uh, weak defense posture of the Philippines um, and uh, and the undergoing um, uh, AFP modernization program, um, they, they see uh, they, those are just in the blueprint right now. Um, there are plans, but of course, uh, when you plan, you need uh, some uh, uh, sophisticated technology, human resources, and money, basically. And of course. The political will coming from the government because even if you plan, if it is not approved by the Politburo, then that becomes also a problem there. And also, it should align to the um, to the uh, policy and uh, strategy of the uh, of the of the government. But it seems like right now we have, uh, like I said, we have flip flopping uh, policies and strategies. That's the reason why, even if you have bright ideas, clever ideas, there, it becomes uh, futile after all because no one is supporting it. Yeah. So we see a lot of mismatches. Okay. Uh, just I'll just uh, go around the table and uh, find out uh, what last questions or statements anyone may have. Tim says he's okay. David? Last question, Chester. In all yeah. this situation, okay, economic development to grow the middle class, to make sure that there are different people who can stand for parliament in 10, 15 years. So you move away for a, a historical elite or you know, reactionary mini oligarchs to people who actually have the interest of the middle class in the country in mind. Where are the best economic opportunities to kickstart? Okay, right, right. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, Mindanao is the promised land in the Philippines. And a lot of Filipinos, particularly from Mindanao, were so happy when Duterte became the president because he's the first president coming from Mindanao. The, 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 it's the promised land, the last frontier that uh, I said, because basically when it comes to natural resources, Mindanao is fair to reach. It is also a backdoor to some of our uh, ASEAN neighbors, maritime ASEAN neighbors like uh, uh, Brunei, Malaysia, Indonesia. And these are all rich countries compared to us uh, in Southeast Asia. And uh, also when, and a lot of investments right now are in, the, in Mindanao, plainly because of the seat of power of Davao, where the president is from, um, from, but also because they see a prospect of development in that region. Really, if you go to Mindanao, it's really beautiful, rich in resources. It's multi-diverse because you see tri people there, meaning to say you have Christians, Muslims, and the indigenous people, which you cannot see in Visayas or in Luzon Islands. Now, um, given the... Uh, the, the um, richness, opulence of that region. I think, um, and also uh, a lot of amalgamation of uh, issues, national security issues are there. You have insurgency, Muslim uh, secessionism, and then of course um, some uh, 
incursions also because the Sulu Sea is very rich in natural resources. And of course, um, the uh, transboundary of migrants also uh, between uh, Malaysia uh, and uh, Indonesia going to the Philippines or Filipinos going to Malaysia and uh, uh, Brunei and to uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, something like that. So you have all those uh, amalgamation of issues there. And uh, I think um, a lot of Filipinos from Mindanao are from Visayas and Luzon would want to migrate to Mindanao because of the many things it want, uh, it can offer. And also the, the, the plan of the government is to decentralize development and progress so that it will not only be contained in Manila. In Visayas, you have Cebu there as the, the sea, Queen City. And then, of course, in Mindanao, you have Dabao. So if we um, decentralize development, then people, Filipinos, would no longer go to Manila. And that would also contain the problem of overpopulation and economic distribution. Because basically, um, if we could uh, distribute, because the problem, uh, the, 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 a lot of questions on inclusive growth has been a main question in the Philippines. Then the, the strategy and the um, plan of the government is to decentralize and distribute wealth evenly from Manila to Cebu to Davao. But amongst the, um, the, the, the islands, main islands in the Philippines, Mindanao is really um, the, the, the promised land so far. And I think this should be the center of development. And like what I said, if we uh, offer development to people and if, the, if Mindanao becomes prosperous, then at least we could contain the issues on terrorism, insurgency, because uh, by, 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 by having middle classes already, uh, a large middle class in, in the Philippines, of course, that would also uh, an answer to the long protracted issues on social injustice, poverty, and uh, unequal distribution of wealth. So really a war on yeah. poverty in Mindanao as a first step to kick everything else off, which gives right, a very right. clear target for where the investment and the capacity building needs to be. So as much as it looks chaotic, you can go, no, if we narrow focus on an island, the benefits will ripple out and we'll also be right. able to judge success much faster. Okay. Uh, uh, Chester, I've got one final yeah, question. Um, now, I know um, strategic forecasting is a is a fraught business. Yeah, yeah. But what is your take on Duterte's chances of winning in twenty twenty two? Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, there are two plans basically, although it's not yet pronounced because that is the tactic now, not to divulge information yet. Because if you do that, people will start scanning your um, um, your bad records and your skeleton in your closet. Uh, but uh, basically, um, uh, the plan that uh, the rumors uh, are, um, one, uh, Sarah is Sarah, the daughter of Duterte, is running for president, and she has huge chances because based from the surveys, every survey uh, that comes out in the Philippines, she tops the survey. Okay. And there are other female uh, pre uh, candidates uh, who are vying for presidency. And the second remedy is to put Duterte as vice president because in our constitution, uh, it is allowed uh, for the president to run another office but not as president because re-election as president is not allowed in our constitution. Remember, there's a precedence. Gloria Arroyo became a congresswoman, a representative, after she became the president. Then there is a proposal that Duterte slash Duterte would be a good tandem, mm. the daughter and father. Well, uh, there are two, my, in my own mind, uh, that would be a uh, advantageous for Rodrigo Duterte because of the many faces, uh, the, many, uh, the many challenges that he will face after his presidency. His immunity will, of course, be, be gone. And definitely he would be charged by the international court and maybe local courts here because of the human rights uh, 
uh, alleged human rights violations that he committed with his drug war and some other uh, controversial policies that he implemented in the Philippines. But um, based from uh, rumors also, the daughter is very smart and has a mind of her own. And uh, she's a trained lawyer and she is married to a lawyer uh, Carpio, and uh, one of our uh, justices, retired justice here, is very vocal about the West Philippine Sea and about the Turkish stance on the West Philippine Sea. So, meaning to say that you know, person, you know, politics in in the Philippines is more personalistic than uh, institutional. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll see a very carnival-like uh, um, uh, um, uh, election in 2022, despite the pandemic that uh, we are still uh, suffering right now. Well, you did say, Chester, that the Philippines is excellent when it comes to lawfare, and it seems like the yeah, Duterte yeah. family is aiming to capture the high ground on that, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> or to crawl to the top of the <laughs> heat. <Hopefully, laughs> we will continue with that. <laughs> Indeed. And hopefully, of course, that's still a strategy. Uh, lawfare is something that uh, where the Philippines has excelled so, excelled so far. And if we continue that in containing China, because uh, that's the only thing that, uh, you know, we need a lot of uh, diplomatic protests and voices and then noises because and uh, because by doing that, uh, that would hound the next generation of uh, Chinese people if they know that uh, there were uh, um, issues that were thrown to them in claiming all those kindness that they have, they, they have in the future, that they will have in the future then it becomes a, a problem on how, a dilemma for them on how, or the legitimacy and sovereignty of their country. Isn't, isn't lawfare though as good as your enforcement? But if you can't enforce the law, yeah. then does it become something less than what it should be? Hmm. Yeah. And also because uh, the, the, the enforcement it becomes, you know, in our Philippine culture, uh, as an anthropologist, wearing my hat as an anthropologist, sir, um, we don't have a culture, a strong culture on implementation. We think a lot, we say a lot, but when it comes to implementation and enforcement, enforcement that becomes our problem. Mm -hmm. And I think we should uh, change change that kind of culture. Culture change is powerful, and it, it, that's intergenerational. Yep. If we cannot do it, maybe the next generation can do it. And of course, we have to echo to them that you know implementation, proper enforcement is the key on changing the behaviors of the Filipinos. Because basically, if we just talk and just think, then that becomes a problem. Although we know that uh, for a fact that we have uh, bright ideas, but when we implement it, uh, it's really not that good. It's wow. inefficient. So it's a two-part strategy. It needs to be economic growth in Mindanao and institutional growth across yeah. the entire country. And everything else really will only stick if it has those two things to hang off of. Well, on that interesting note, I think we shall call that one a wrap. Thank you very much to our spe uh, special guest, uh, Dr. Ch uh, Chester Cabalza, for being on Strategicon. My thanks to co-host David Olney and to producer Tim for their contributions. And to our audience, thanks for listening. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to the audio version of Strategicon through the Ozcast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. And please like us on the Sage International Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. You can also watch our podcasts on video through the Strategicon Raw YouTube channel when they are available, easily accessed by clicking on the link provided on our website. Also, please comment on any of our articles and podcasts through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course, on the Sage International site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products, and we look forward to engaging with our followers. If you would like to support Strategicon, remember to check out our merch page. We have a wide variety of items to keep the Strategicon listeners satisfied. Until next time, goodbye.